Well, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our 14th Teddy Talk, and uh, of course, our first virtual Teddy Talk. Um, very privileged that we have Ian Smith and Stephen Smith uh, conducting our discussion this afternoon. And um, I should tell you that we had already planned for Ian and Stephen to talk on the subjects of the NHS and reform during this, this Trinity term. Um, but clearly, when we uh, arranged that with Stephen and Ian, we had no idea that coronavirus would be dominating all of our lives and that this talk would become perhaps more timely than we could have possibly imagined. Um, Ian is a Alarian. He um, came up and read geography at the Hall in 1972. He's led a distinguished career in business and healthcare and has hold it, a whole, uh, held um, chair roles, both as chair of the Four Seasons Healthcare and most recently chair of King's College Hospital. He's joined this afternoon by his brother, Professor Stephen Smith. Uh, Stephen's a trained gynaecologist, also having a distinguished career in healthcare, publishing over 230 research papers. And Stephen is now the chair of East Kent Hospitals. Also joining us on the line uh, is the Hall's fellow in physiology, uh, Professor Robert Wilkins. Um, uh, Robert leads the Hall's medicine and biomedical science courses and um, will be able to take questions and, and talk about how what we hear from Ian and Stephen links to what is happening at the Hall and the teaching of students today. And I am Gareth Simpson, I am the Development Director at the Hall, and it's my task this afternoon to try and moderate this discussion um, via the new technology that we're all coming familiar with. Um, three months ago, nobody knew what was to Zoom is, but we all seem to be here and, and getting acquainted with it. Um, to, help, to help us um, run the, the session over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, um, we thought we'd have Ian and Stephen talk for around about 15 to 20 minutes to provide an overview. Um, and then we'll allow plenty of time for questions. But to help us moderate those questions, if you could, if you're able to type a question into the chat box, it doesn't need to be a detailed question, but just the theme of your question. So for example, you know, I have a question about care homes. Um, that will allow us to group them together. I will then unmute you, you're all currently muted, um, I will then unmute you so you can ask the question directly. I'll also unmute the people that have raised a similar themed question so that we can try and get some back and forth as if we would normally when we're together in the room. And at the end, I'll unmute everybody. And if everybody's got any kind of general comment that they'd like to make, then um, that will be the time to do so. Uh, but clearly, this is the first time we've done a large talk in this way. So if I could ask your forbearance with the technology. Um, and and also love your feedback as to whether this is something that we should be looking to repeat in the future. Obviously, we've been sort of forced into doing it this way, but actually this could be a really terrific way for the whole community to connect across all of our different time zones and all of our different countries and regions that we live in. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian and Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for joining uh, everybody. Uh, Stephen and I are going to go through uh, quite a clip. Uh, bringing out some of the highlights uh, in the paper that we uh, circulated. Um, uh, but we really want to keep a lot of time for questions uh, and comments uh, from you. So we'll go pretty fast through this, so pay attention. <laughs> the first thing to say is that the NHS staff uh, and social care staff have done a fantastic job responding to this uh, uh, crisis. I think we're all in uh, uh, great uh, thankfulness and uh, respect. Uh, for the sacrifices uh, that those people are making. But I also think that the, uh, the crisis has highlighted some of the structural uh, constraints uh, that are making the life of clinicians even before COVID-19 uh, quite difficult. Uh, and they're the things that we will focus on. We'll talk a bit about COVID-19, but we'll also talk about the structural uh, constraints in the system. And hopefully coming out of COVID-19, we'll see a renewed appetite um, for uh, productive change uh, in the NHS. <clears throat> four, uh, four constraints or structural problems that I'll highlight, and we'll come back to it over the next 15 minutes. Underfunding, um, social care has been badly underfunded for the last 10 years, eight billion pound cut in funding for social care at a time clearly when uh, uh, the population is aging and comorbidities um, and chronic disease, lifestyle diseases, uh, are on the increase, but even the NHS, although it's been better funded, uh, still per capita funding about 30% less than in uh, uh, Germany. 
Secondly, an over-centralized approach. Obviously, we need a national uh, response to things like COVID-19, a good example. Um, but I'm not sure, in fact, I don't think we have got the right balance between devolved um, management uh, and clinician practice within the health service and appropriate, the appropriate types uh, of national platforms uh, to take advantages of economies of scope and scale. Thirdly, we have a highly fragmented system. Uh, that's not just between social care and uh, healthcare. That is a ragged crack um, that too many frail elderly people particularly uh, fall down. But even within uh, the NHS, you know, if you try to get a system meeting in any NHL, in NHS economy, you know, you've got about 20 or 30 people at the table representing different NHS organizations, and that makes it very difficult to have consistency of uh, management. And uh, something I'll talk about later, it's, it's an undermanaged system. Managing the NHS, in the NHS is not easy, um, and it requires top quality management, preferably more clinician managers who can relate, obviously, with the uh, clinicians uh, better. We have too few managers, and they are under-supported and underdeveloped. As a result, although we have some of the best and most dedicated clinicians in the world, uh, although it's free at the point of care and therefore we have uh, access, and despite the UK being um, one of the leading biomedical science countries in the world, and not as uh, powerful of course as the United States, but uh, we certainly punch way above our weight, uh, we do have some of the worst health outcomes uh, in the developed world. So in a uh, in the Commonwealth Fund uh, report, the UK came 10th out of 11 countries in terms of health, uh, health outcomes. Um, so obviously there are things we need to, uh, uh, to improve. I'll hand over to Stephen now to talk a bit about the shortages and underfunding in acute care, which are coming particularly prominent with COVID-19. Uh, and Steve, who's a clinician scientist, uh, not just a clinician, uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the science of, uh, of coronavirus. Over to you, Steve. Very much, Ian, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to put a, a little bit of background, I, I was a prof of Ops and Gynae in Cambridge for about 20 years, and my college was Fitzwilliam, which, of course, is the sister college of uh, Teddy Hall. Uh, but more recently, Ian made the point about medical executives. I was also chief executive at Imperial for four years, um, you know, the big academic health science centre. Um, so I, I, I do have a lot of experience on the executive side as well as the clinician science side. Um, but the point that Ian's making is that we're all uh, painfully aware of the lack of resources in our National Health Service. And although um, the NHS has done a truly remarkable uh, job at uh, increasing by three to fourfold our intensive care unit beds, it is important to recognize that on most of the parameters of acute care, and this is an acute care crisis, obviously, the United Kingdom started off in every regard at the bottom of the pack. So we have the lowest number of hospital beds per thousand head of population. We have 2.8, Germany has 8.8, France has six. We have the lowest number of doctors per head of population in the acute sector. We have the lowest number of nurses per head of population. And we have the lowest number of diagnostic facilities, MRI, CT scans, etc., uh, per head of population. And we have the lowest number of Linex, uh, which are the machines you use for cancer treatment than anywhere else. So when, when discussing preparedness, uh, we in the National Health Service <clears throat> were basically not prepared. Now, there are many reasons for that. But, but you cannot run a healthcare system which runs at 95 to 98 percent bed occupancy. And then we, we, you shouldn't be doing that incidentally in normal times, but you undoubtedly cannot run a healthcare system that can handle anything akin to a pandemic without substantial changes to the standards of care which you're normally able to provide, which we're all seeing, uh, unless we change this uh, in, in the future. So our preparedness uh, was well below par. And in a, in a sense, that's not, COVID has been the crisis which has exposed the issue. We're now running most of our hospitals, acute hospitals, at something like 60% bed occupancy. Now you might say, how on earth can it be that you're so inundated with all of these patients, which we are in intensive care, and our staff and managers are absolutely dead on their feet as we speak. 
But what has happened is that a substantial number of patients, in my trust case, which is the ninth biggest in the UK, we have moved 250 patients out of the hospital, uh, all of whom are medically fit and have, if you like, been passed by the doctors and nurses to go home. We've been able to move them into the care homes, back home, and into a range of facilities. So you begin to see uh, the structural problems that are arising. <clears throat> Ian made the point that the, the uh, public is understandably proud of the outstanding and selfless um, uh, dedication of our NHS staff. And indeed, one of my non-executives has gone back to nursing on the front line and just finished her night shift. And in graphic detail, describes the fear of staff on the front line last night because of patients coughing. These are COVID positive patients and not having the right amount of uh, kit. So there is beginning to open up a narrative, uh, which is I would uh, analogize to the sort of First World War type stuff. Wonderful troops going over the top in 1916, but there is a question mark about the generals. And that applies particularly when it comes to the central administration and control. So there is on the one hand an instant recognition that you need to be centrally organized, but when you're in the trenches at the front line and you haven't got the bullets and you haven't got the uh, equipment, you know that that facility and that ability uh, has been found to be uh, very heavily challenged. And that could be no better epitomized by the issue of testing, which is well rehearsed almost every night on the television. And what's happened explains it. It's not fleet of foot enough to be able to do enough testing to prevent the surge, but it is slower, but does eventually get there when you're wanting to come out of the lockdown. The problem is there are an awful lot and large numbers of patients who have become infected who if we had been able to move more rapidly and quicker and do the test, trace and isolate, uh, would not, we would not be in this position. So there are some very fundamental questions which we need to put uh, around the structure of the NHS. The frontline staff are um, exhausted. Uh, they are not great fans of the centre. Might, um, I'll take over for the next bit. We might come back to the science, Steve, you can talk a bit about uh, yep. RNA, DNA, and so on. Um, and some of the, just to pick up on some of the uh, challenges, uh, I think the centre in the UK, NHS England, NHS, I often been uncertain whether they're regulators or their corporate support. I think they should be definitely corporate support. It's hard enough managing um, and treating patients on the, on the front line. Uh, and a lot of the central activity is quite distracting uh, rather than supportive of that uh, uh, policy. And a lot of the, a lot of the, the uh, problems in the center, I think they mistake policy for strategy. In fact, we had a policy for pandemic response after Operation Cygnus. Um, but the problem with government generally and the NHS in particular is that putting that policy and plans into practice falls down. Uh, and too often, I think there is a, a tendency to do a big top-down reorganization, uh, which they mistake for action. And actually all it ends up doing is making it more complicated, more difficult for clinicians and managers on the ground. Um, I think we need to balance devolution so that we have uh, decisions being made closer to local populations, um, but do need the national platform so we can respond to something like the pandemic or that we can manage best practice across uh, the full network. At the moment, we have many of the disadvantages of centralization, top-down reorganizations without any of the benefits, uh, such as nationwide uh, clinical protocols. Um, I believe, and I believe this for ever since I've been in social care back from 2012, we should immediately integrate health and social care. There is nothing to prevent this happening. Uh, the departments of adult social care and child social care uh, can quite easily be merged into a new form uh, of health and social care delivery. Um, and as I said at the start, uh, the ragged gaps between health and social care in the UK uh, are killing people, literally killing people. Over time, I think devolution is necessary because we have to start and we've understood much better uh, the social and economic determinants of ill health. Many of you will have read uh, Professor Marmot's work, which he first published 10 years ago and has recently updated. 
Um, Eighty percent of a person's health is is determined by their life circumstances. So the NHS can only impact about twenty percent of a person's health. Of course, if you're acutely ill, that's hugely important. Uh, but if we really want to improve the well-being uh, and health and get a get a grip of those um, poor uh, health and social care outcomes, uh, then we really have to start looking at the full range of factors um, that uh, determine um, well-being and uh, and health. Um, and um, and that that's education, that's employment, uh, social policy. Um, and uh, and until we start getting a hold of those, and we've got you know we don't do very well in the UK on any of those compared to the European countries. And um, you know if you're born in a bad part, poor part of Birkenhead, um, compared to sunny Wimbledon where I'm sitting now, um, you will have 19 years of um, additional ill health for a poor person compared to a rich person. So we have dreadful health inequalities in this country, uh, and that puts a burden on the NHS and more importantly, of course, it damages, uh, it damages lives. That health inequality has got worse over the last 10 years. Um, and um, uh, shockingly, um, the health outcomes in the poorest in our society uh, have gotten worse. So over the last 10 years, infant and child mortality, and this is shocking, infant and child mortality in the bottom 20% of our society has been on the increase, which is pretty, pretty shocking. So I'll hand over to Stephen now. We are beginning to see some of these issues, poor system working, fragmentation, um, poor levels of cooperation beginning to be overcome. So why don't you talk a little bit, Steve, about uh, particularly what you're seeing uh, in East Kent and then I'll, uh, I'll conclude. Yeah, well, just, just very quickly on the vaccine stuff. I mean, you're seeing it all on the television. We're all hopeful, although I should point out that the other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, do not yet have a vaccine and the other famous uh, HIV virus also does not have a vaccine. <clears throat> so whilst we're all desperately, desperately hopeful that this will work, um, there are still some very serious questions. The uh, idea that you can raise antibodies and possibly get the disease again has been dispelled by some very neat work in the United States, notably, showing that you can still have fragments of the virus, but it actually comes from um, truncated virus, which is actually dead. Uh, and therefore, it does seem to be the case that if you do raise antibodies, there may be some degree of immunity. Nobody yet knows how long it lasts for, because obviously we've only had people with the disease for a few months of time. So um, the first bit is the, uh, is the science. Um, the next bit is the, uh, is the structure. Um, effectively, the normal way of working has been transformed. And it's not just in Kent. But I'm delighted to say that we are the third biggest taker upper of general practitioners stopping consultations. Over 50% of general practitioner consultations in Kent are now done on the telephone. Furthermore, that uh, GP can get real time advice from a consultant in the hospital whilst the patient is on the other end of Zoom uh, to allow them to have an, uh, an opinion and subsequently to pick up or even have delivered their drugs at home. So we are beginning to see a, an integration of community, mental health, social services, and the acute trusts. And it is not the acute trusts taking over the GPs, which they would never agree to, nor would it be GPs taking over the acute trusts. They tried that for the last 10 years and it was a failure, they're called CCGs. Um, it is the hospital being, because that's where the competency is, uh, being the facilitator whereby, if you like, you can hang off the rest of the healthcare system. And I have to say the willingness and desire for the system to work together, I've never seen anything as, uh, uh, as uh, close as it is now. The IT systems and the AI and machine learning which need to go into that are actually now available and being put into space. So on the, uh, on the other side, there is a very real opportunity here for us not to go back to square one, which would be a disaster because we cannot continue to run our health service the way we have. And I do think that the system, tired and exhausted though it is, is, uh, is currently open for a new way of working. Back to you, Ian. And uh, just to conclude then, let's hope this, uh, this crisis does, uh, does generate some reforms. Uh, the primary care system, Stephen mentioned, you know, independent uh, GP 
Uh, GPs uh, you know, offering nine minute consultations, which they don't like. Obviously the patient don't, doesn't like. We need to move from that uh, to much more focus on the most vulnerable in our society, the high risk care management programs. Um, we need more funding. And I think, uh, Stephen, I think uh, that we need a hypothecated uh, tax. I think British people would be prepared to pay more for healthcare, but not if it's coming out of a generalized, you know, a generalized tax pool. If we had a hypothe hypothecated tax, then we could make that more regressive so that richer people are paying uh, more money. Um, I, having worked in both uh, the care home sector and uh, the NHS, the acute trust, we really need to make community-based care a key part of this system rather than something that, that, uh, you know, that uh, hangs, on the, uh, hangs on the edge. About a half of the 450,000 beds in care homes are local authority funded. They should be a key part of the system so that the discharge a clinician or executive in a hospital has mm -hmm. control over the capacity in their region, knows where the beds are, the packages of care uh, are available. You don't have this horrible uh, argument between local authorities and the acute trust and the CCG as you try to place a person out of hospital, which means that that person can stay in hospital uh, for a week, even longer if they're an out of area um, uh, resident. I think the care home f sector needs better regulation. Uh, it's been over leveraged. It's been uh, messed around by private equity. I think CQC should take on financial regulation uh, so that we give a return on investment rather than the uh, the uh, shenanigans that have been going on with private equity in, care, in the care home sector. And finally, as I mentioned at the start, it's astonished me going into the NHS. These are difficult places to manage. A hospital like King's has 1,200 beds, 40 operating theatres. It sees a million outpatients uh, a year. This is as difficult as any management uh, in the private sector. Uh, yet managers in the, uh, there are too few clinician managers. There's no path for clinicians to become competent managers. Uh, and for the managers who are in the NHS, they're badly supported, often undermined uh, by the center or by politicians who call them overhead uh, and bureaucracy. You cannot manage the complexity of a mon modern health and social care system uh, with those sort of uh, um, uh, attitudes. Uh, I mentioned a medical MBA that I think uh, should be developed in the UK in the paper. In the Netherlands, America, Australia, most of the senior uh, managers of the big hospital groups are both clinicians, they're consultants, uh, but many of them also have business uh, MBAs. So I will uh, stop there. We're at a bit over the 20 minute mark there, Gareth, um, because we're really interested in hearing people's comments or, or, or fielding any questions you've got. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ian and Stephen. We did promise plenty of time for questions. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Zoom, there is a chat fun chat function at the bottom of the screen. You can um, send a message via that to everybody who is on this call, or 76 people. Um, or if you have your video on and you want to raise a, raise a point, just put your hand up and I'll look out for you. Um, but we have two questions that connect to each other. The first from Ian Coleman and, and then Tony uh, Best has a follow on question. So uh, Ian, if I can go to you first, thanks. Ian, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think I've uh, uh, typed in something that people may have seen, which is, uh, has COVID-19 uh, deification of the NHS made legitimate debate about its efficiency and effectiveness so politically incorrect that we're going to struggle to move forwards uh, on things such as alternative funding models, many of which produce better international outcomes? Uh, and I think both uh, France, Germany and others um, uh, tend to have better health outcomes in terms of, of uh, cancer treatments and so forth, um, uh, but also uh, have a, a, a quite different uh, funding model uh, where it isn't uh, uh, essentially universal access out of taxation, uh, but there's a greater mixture of, of delivery mechanisms. Yeah, well, I think it is going to make it difficult, uh, as you say. But, you know, that's the role of politicians. You know, the role of politicians is, is to make, you know, the case uh, to the public uh, to say why change is necessary and how it will improve things. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I, I think we've got to hold our politicians much more to account um, and, uh, you know, and senior managers in the NHS and NHS England uh, and NHSI, you know, hold them much more accountable for making these arguments 
uh, that we do need more money and we can only get that through a hypothecated uh, tax, uh, that we need to integrate health and social care, I think we need to be more, uh, more challenging. Uh, and can I say, you know, you're being far too polite in saying tend to have worse outcomes. The United Kingdom has substantially worse outcomes than all other of the 28 or whatever it is OECD countries. And we have, the, we have some of the worst cancer outcomes. We have some of the worst cardiovascular outcomes. We have some of the highest deaths attributable to a healthcare system for those over 65. As Ian mentioned, we have stillbirth rates which are going up. We have neonatal death rates which are 40% worse than in Sweden, for example. I don't think we should be sparing in the issue of outcomes. Are the motivation of the people in the system who are at the front line, they are outstanding. But I would have thought if anything, and I do take your point about the deification, the deification is of the people at the front line. It isn't of the system, unfortunately. The problem, as Ian says, is how do we make that political point? From politicians, frankly, who have a vested interest in not letting go the healthcare agenda. When, because we don't fight so many wars, although unfortunately the last 20 years that might not be true, it means that health is one of the most powerful and important portfolios that you can have as a politician. And therefore I would be very surprised if they were keen to give it up. 100,000 tests, I might say, being the latest um, uh, representation of a political decision not backed up by the, uh, by the, uh, by the science. And I would point out Germany, who on every measure uh, succeeded on the testing, and it succeeded on the testing because it is a devolved system. It did not go for a central solution. It went for devolved laboratories, as suggested by Paul Nurse. And when, the, when it becomes accountable at the end of all of this, that factor will begin to play because that has an effect on lives. So I think de deification is true but I do think it is time for us to move harder and faster on a serious discussion of how we fund and run our NHS. Uh, Tom, you, you had a follow-on question about devolution and postcode lotteries. The fact is with centralization, we have a huge postcode lottery. So, you know, that, that's occurring currently. I think we need devolution so that we're integrating health and social care locally and, and there aren't cross-cutting top-down initiatives made from a, a sort of policy hungry uh, political and senior management uh, point of view. And the people on the ground are really working to figure out the epidemiology of this local population, these needs, and shaping things uh, to make that happen. Of course, we want to uh, avoid silos and, uh, you know, and spread best practice, but that, is the, that should be the role of something like the CQC, uh, which at the moment is mostly just an inspection agency and actually quite punitive and unhelpful. Um, but if it did take on the role, maybe uh, in partnership with NICE, which has been one of the great successes of a central uh, organization, then, um, you know, identifying variation was a very good program for any of you who are at one of the one good programs coming out of the center of the NHS, getting it right first time by Professor Tim Briggs, you know, which is an evidence-based program. It says if you do your real orthopedic surgery this way, you will get better outcomes. These are the outliers. Uh, this is how we spread best practice throughout the country. That's the sort of thing that a national uh, body should be doing. And then leave it to local uh, communities to, uh, to firstly uh, make that happen, integrate health and social care. And as I said, over the longer term, employment, education, housing, all the other things that drive the uh, health and well-being uh, of citizens. Well, thank you. Thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Tony Best, you had a question um, following on from Ian's initial question. Um, I don't know if you feel if that's been answered or whether you'd like to, to go back to that. Okay, Tony, I'll come back to you. And then we have a question from um, Tom Moon. Um, Oh, I'm just going to unmute you if you want to go ahead with your question. Hi, um, thank you, Ian, and thank you, Stephen. Um, so I guess historically, healthcare's had a pretty poor um, track record for adopting technology. And at, at a hospital level, that's often because maybe they don't have a specific budget um, or you know, the business model in place to make it work or, or the incentives. Um, clearly, there's an acute incentive at the moment to adopt certain types of technology. Um, video conferencing for GPs is the obvious one. 
do you think this will be a, a temporary spike or, or, will, or, or, or is this the beginning of a big catalyst for digitization of healthcare? Do you want to go first, Steve? Um, well, you're absolutely right. The NP Fit programme, which was a complete disaster and wasted £15 billion of NHS money. <clears throat> Hopefully it'll be an opportunity because <clears throat> what we are seeing is clinical initiatives <coughs> excuse me, are being taken forward and uh, that's a great hope. Um, the money is, to be honest with you, at the moment not a particular issue. It's the technical competence of the managers and I don't mean the, their IT knowledge. It's just knowing how they fit into the healthcare system is the biggest constraint I would see at the moment. Ian? Yeah, I think um, I think GP consultations, digital consultations, will get a boost as a result of this. Obviously, there are there are a number of companies now that have set up uh, to do this. Babylon, Push Doctor, uh, Doctor Care, anywhere. Obviously, they've had problems, and and I think the problems they've had actually, I think, point to some of the structural issues that we have uh, we've raised. So I think we'll see a move on that. Um, but we need to go much further. I mean, the real um, IT need, the real tech need in this is to have full visibility of a patient's uh, care record throughout that patient's pathway. So if they have an acute event and the hospital goes, the ambulance goes there, the ambulance needs to be able to see who that person is, what medication they're on, what their history is. Uh, when they're taken into A&E, they need to, the A&E staff need to, to have the same record. Uh, the social care people who have been dealing with that person need to know that that person's gone into hospital and preferably go into hospital. Uh, and uh, try to get the patient out as quickly as, as possible. That end-to-end -end visibility just doesn't exist. I mean, I went out a number of times with London Ambulance in my time at King's College Hospital. You know, you'd get to some frail old lady, um, frail elderly lady who's had a fall, early stage dementia, and you know nothing about that patient. I mean, often we would, with the patient's permission, you know, with the ambulance staff, go through her drawers to see which medication she is on. So we need that visibility end to end, otherwise we are going to fail. And the numbers aren't that big actually, you know. Um, in, uh, in King's we had a, a very good initiative actually that was trying to integrate health and social care, introduce high risk care management. So Bromley is about 350,000 people, there's one uh, acute there, the Princess Royal University Hospital which is part of King's College. And we identified there the 17, there's only 1,700 patients who are the highly vulnerable, you know, high risk who are traveling into hospital regularly. And we put a care package and a care program around each of those so that we could uh, manage full cycles uh, of care. And it started putting in place the visibility so that the London Ambulance would see the record and um, that if they did go into hospital, it would be an alert to their care manager. Um, and obviously once they're in hospital, they have a care record. So it's really that end to end and what it points up is the chronic underinvestment in IT systems in the NHS, because very few, I mean, not many, not all hospitals have an electronic patient record, uh, let alone visibility across social care, healthcare, GPs, primary care, community-based care, and so on. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in that I think relate to each other around um, taxation and um, the value that we place on our, well, that's a very philosophical question of value that we place on our own lives. Um, but before we move on to those, because I think that's a slight change of direction, can I just ask Tony, um, Tony, I'm going to unmute you, if we can go back to your questions, and then I'm going to go to Edward Hobart, who asked about devolution. And if anybody has got anything relating to the conversation that we've just had around devolution and um, the subjects that Ian and Stephen have already raised, you just put your hand up or flag that now because um, after these two questions, I'll move on to the, the taxation questions uh, that we've got sitting in the boxes there. So, Tony. Yeah, Gareth, uh, thank you very much. Um, it sort of goes back to this question uh, of, of what you've been describing about structure. Is, is why is this time going to be any different? Um, I mean, there's been lots of clever doctors and, and medics talking about restructuring the National Health Service for as long as any of us can remember. This thing is a crisis, but it will pass. And the idea of throwing more money at the problem with a, with a bunch of uh, management structures that just continue to get it wrong seems to me precisely the worst outcome for us. I mean, I was looking at the new SAGE group that's just been announced today, 
it's got 50 people on it. Um, I mean, you, you read through it and it's incredible how many different people from different areas, which only confirms the sort of spaghetti organization around this whole problem. So my question is, why is this time going to be any different? Yeah, well, I think um, it won't be different unless we make it different. And I think we've really got to challenge the NHS to allow these solutions to come from the bottom up. I mean, that's the failure of the uh, of the center here coming up with fancy policy. I mean, they're great at policy papers. I mean, if you read the five year forward view, the 10 year plan, you know, it's absolutely fantastic policy and aspiration. Problem is it never gets put into practice. What you need is the people on the ground who know the problems. I mean, in the case of Bromley, uh, the lead commissioner there, excellent lady called Angela Barn, um, pulled together the Bromley coalition. So she got all of the, the council, uh, the community care, the PRU, uh, and Kings, everybody sitting around the same table, got it down to six people, which is still a lot of people. Um, but you've really got to give power to those people to come up with those, uh, those initiatives from the bottom up uh, and then drive change that way. Otherwise, we're going to get more and more top-down uh, initiatives. And, and, and actually, even Angela's efforts were cut across by the latest reorganization into ICSs, STPs, and all the other uh, alphabet soup uh, that we have from the, uh, the centre. Steve, do you want to comment? Yeah, I just I just add to that. The uh, all of the changes that we've introduced over the last four weeks have been done without the clinical care groups. Now, if you remember, the clinical care groups were the so-called purchaser provider split. Now, the good side of that is that clinicians, and I really mean clinicians at the front line, have been able to make changes, real changes, enacting, as I say. We managed to remove 250 patients out of our hospital in three days, having failed to do it in two years. The downside, of course, is that money at the moment is no, is no issue at all. There is no problem over money because there is no, there's plenty of money. Nobody, all we're doing is, is putting the, uh, the checks into a drawer. There is no control. So I completely agree with you. There's a concern that uh, once you actually get some financial measures in again, it won't be quite so straightforward. But I come back to the crucial point. If you give acute hospitals a target, and the targets are all, uh, some are good and some are bad, but if you set the target a certain amount of bed occupancy, you then hand the whole thing back into the system to, uh, to, 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 to manage that, as it were. And there is no reason, judging from what's happened in COVID, as to why we in Britain cannot do that. It, it also makes the point that how much more money do we need in acute services? It may be if you manage it better, better management of care homes, better management of GPs, et cetera, it might be possible to do. So I think you're right, there is a risk because at the moment we have an over-centralized system which never takes responsibility, by the way, You've got to remember that the legal responsibility lies with the medical or nursing professional who undertakes the task and the corporate responsibility does not lie with the NHS. The corporate responsibility lies with the general practice or the trust. So the centre never takes responsibility for the decisions which it makes and I think those are two fundamental problems. I mean, one thing we do need to do is to give people authority. So if you, if you look at the, the, the way that healthcare works, you know, the, the, the top level is about two to five million people where you've got real scale efficiencies in tertiary uh, care, tertiary and secondary care. That cascades down. A typical uh, district general hospital will cover about 700,000 people. I think the right sort of scale to do the type of high risk care management program I described in Bromley is about 350,000 people. And the right scale for a polyclinic um, is about 50,000 people. So, you know, we, you, you've got to chunk things up and you've got to give people real authority um, for being able to manage uh, those, uh, those uh, territories. Now, many of you have been in management like uh, me for, for a long time. Uh, and I've had many a callow young manager come to me and say, just give me the authority, uh, Mr. Smith, and I'll kick ass, take names. But it's never as easy as that, of course. You have to have all the other management skills of getting consensus of figuring out root causes, uh, of having good metrics. So just being given the authority is not enough. There's still a very big and tough management uh, challenge. Um, but certainly without authority, you haven't got a hope in health. Thanks, Ian and Stephen. We've got a number of questions um, in the queue. Um, Edward 
Hobart, before we move on, did you have any concluding remarks about devolution or do you feel that we've addressed that? Edward, I'm about to, I'm, I have unmuted you. I think, Gareth, let's move on to, uh, to other subjects. Thank you. Okay, um, there's been a, um, some questions around taxation and um, how we as the public value our own health and the NHS. I'm going to unmute Akash, Lawrence and Douglas because I think those three relate together. But Akash, could you perhaps go ahead with your question? Certainly. Thank you for, for organizing this event. Um, I should preface this by saying this is a genuine question. It's not a, a statement described as a question, especially from myself as, as someone, as a Canadian, and someone living in Canada. Uh, much, many of the contributions thus far have been based on the idea that the NHS is not achieving its objectives. That, um, but I, I wonder if that's the case. In other words, the amount of funding that governments provide to public health in any country reflects in part the value that those governments place on the lives of its citizens, especially the value it places relative to other political objectives, such as economic development, um, foreign policy, and the whole range of, of public activities. I'm wondering, is it possible that the NHS is not falling short, but in fact, it is functioning as intended? In other words, is it possible that the government of the United Kingdom and the electorate of the United Kingdom who choose that government simply place a lower value on the lives of the citizens compared to the, that of other states. Douglas, I think, sorry yeah. Ian, to cut across you. Uh, Douglas, do, do you just want to make your point? Because I think you have uh, yeah, something okay. to add on it. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, well, I, th I think I'm reasonably up to date with what's going on in general, but I don't detect that much of what you've talked about is really on the agenda. So sort of most surveys reveal, I think, that if you do a Vox Pop survey in the street, you'll find that people are prepared to pay more for the NHS. But it's never, all this comparative performance is not on the pages of the Daily Mail or the Guardian. And so, you know, how do you get this, you know, our comparatively terrible performance <laughs> onto the agenda? And, yeah, just as a, a quick follow-up, do you reckon that sort of post-Brexit open access to US health providers would help or hinder with this? Uh, I think I think we've got to do better on this as a country. I think one of the reasons that there isn't as much public outrage, if you like, is that, as I said earlier, the burden is falling on the most vulnerable in our society, the poorest 20%, um, who have the least voice. So for the middle class people who, you know, have got a brother like I have in healthcare and I can go to him and uh, get recommended to the best consultants. Um, you know, the system works fine, frankly. I think the problem is that the people who don't have voice, who are the most disadvantaged uh, by the system, um, don't have, uh, you know, don't have political clout. Um, but I think we are going to have to, you know, just in terms of fairness, perhaps coming out of this, I think we are going to have to make this more, uh, take this more seriously, and not just uh, fairness, fairness, but the, the impact the real cost of this, because if we do not look after the poorest 20% of our population, they do not go away. They turn up at A&E, they turn up at hospital, uh, they go into a hospital bed, which will cost three or four thousand uh, pounds a week. Um, so the cost of poverty generally, and indeed of a, an unhealthy population specifically, is something, it's not too difficult to figure that out. We need to make that case to the politicians uh, and the senior policy makers uh, and uh, make, a, make a change. The other, the other reason, and Stephen might talk about this, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is Britain's lead in biomedical science. You know, we've got four or five of the best universities in the world in biomedical science, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Imperial, King's, um, and UCLH. You know, we need to invest in this because actually this sector generates a huge amount of wealth for the country. And we're going to run the risk, especially with genetic medicine, because you really need to connect um, the... Uh, uh, academic science, which has been pretty separate because of the way clinical trials and small molecules worked, you really need to connect with gen genetic medicine to clinical practice, to the gen genotype and phenotype, um, so that we maintain our lead in biomedical science. Without that, we're going to become more impoverished. And again, that argument needs to be made uh, very strongly as a reason for spending more money in the system. Steve, do you want to uh, comment uh, on the... The reason we set up academic health science centres, I can't remember how long ago it was now, in sort of about 10 years ago when I set it up, uh, was to try and get uh, our discoveries to the patients as quickly as possible. So it has two missions. The first is obviously it's a multi-billion business 
and interestingly, uh, it's important to reflect, <clears throat> the Germans are strong in diagnostics, we're good in therapeutics. So whilst the Germans will make cash out of the diagnostic argument, if this becomes a therapeutic, then the United Kingdom is likely to, uh, to be good at that uh, <clears throat> side of it. So um, the, the two should be linked. The problem is that the university sector and the NHS find it very, very, very difficult to work together. And that has a detrimental effect on patients because if you study a, a drug, uh, you get it into clinical practice usually about two years earlier than other systems. And the vaccines is a very good exemplar. Britain is extremely good at vaccines, but let's be clear, Americans make 80% of all drugs. And whilst America has a dreadful uh, social healthcare system to distribute that money, the chances of the United Kingdom having the winner down and out vaccine winner is, you know, is a pretty slim chance. The Americans are more than likely to beat us. And by the way, if they don't, the Chinese will. So it's about putting that in, and getting it into the measure. It's very difficult to explain to somebody in the health service why biomedical research matters. It's almost an esoteric thing which goes on in Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, and even UC. Um, uh, it's that problem which we've grappled with in Britain for a very long time. And Can I answer to your question on the Americans? I mean, I think we've got to take best practice from wherever, well, obviously in pharmaceuticals, they are the major game in town, you know, 30, 40, 50% of, uh, of drugs are developed in the United States. So, you know, if we went the Jeremy Corbyn route, um, frankly, we would kill people. So we really don't want to, to do that. I think we've got to, nobody would take the American system. I mean, they've got, they've got worse per capita health outcomes than we have. So it's, it's very bimodal, you know, excellent clinical care in the, and science in America mm. is the best in the world, but there are about 40 million people uh, who don't have health insurance uh, who have very poor outcomes. So their average is, as I said earlier, about we're 10th out of 11 countries in the Commonwealth Fund uh, health outcomes, America is the 11th. Um, none, having said that, there are many things that they innovate. Kaiser Permanente, people have heard about that. Uh, we actually brought over um, somebody from Boston, Massachusetts, um, uh, Partners Healthcare, who have introduced, who have reconfigured primary care around high-risk care management, uh, the program I described, he came over and worked uh, with our people, clinicians in Bromley, for a couple of months to bring there. So we need to look at best practice wherever it is uh, in the world and not get into that sort of Jeremy Corbyn, we're privatizing the NHS, the Americans are going to buy us out. It's just uh, nonsense. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, everybody, for those questions. Um, we've um, not much time left and actually quite a few questions to go. Um, could I come to Mr. Nichols? I think, is that Humphrey? Uh, are you there? Um, who has got a question on previous NHS reforms or a point to make on that. And also Luke Jones, who also has a question about reform. And then I've seen that we have Stanley, Roger and Simon also waiting to, to make report um, points. So, uh, Mr. Nichols, if you can go ahead, I'll unmute yourself and I'll unmute Luke Jones. OK, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, first of all, I just wanted to sort of hammer home the points that you've already made about devolution and management. The NHS employs roughly a million people. There isn't a business in the world that's successful that has that many employees and be all that successfully manages it. It is almost by definition impossible. You have to delegate and delegate extensively. I believe that the NHS's role therefore in, in that respect to go back to Bevan's original idea it's two, it's, it, it's, it's two parts. One is quality control and the other is finance. It does not necessarily mean owning hospitals and employing people. They can be employed by independent trusts, they can be employed by private sector companies, all operating and audited against a set of quality outcomes. Um, and the costs of reimbursement can be standardized. The NHS developed a system for elective surgery, for instance, back in the 90s. So, but it's never been implemented. All of these things, I think, could be done. And I think also within individual, there are two other very important things that have to happen before any change is realistically feasible. The, there are two fundamental cultural problems within the NHS. One is there is a blame culture, 
Yeah. And B, there is no culture of delegated decision-making responsibility and ensuring that the people to whom the responsibility is delegated are properly trained to discharge that <clears throat> responsibility. Now, those things are feasible, but currently I don't believe they happen, or if they do, they are isolated cases within the whole NHS structure. Well, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's absolutely right. And, and the blame culture is getting worse. Uh, CQC have gone on a really bad path of, of, uh, of prosecuting uh, unintended clinical error. You know, that's the best way of creating cover-ups, of creating defense, yeah. which itself uh, um, is, uh, is very bad. So I think CQC is urgently in need of a, of a U-turn. Delegated authority decision-making it's a bloody environment, as but I said. My question after all of that is how do you envisage getting through to the politicians, getting the politicians to listen and act rather than covering their asses and trying to be re elected? Because that's been historically the problem. Tony Blair had the biggest manager, and I quite challenged him on these issues on Newsnight once years ago, I mean, so many years ago, I can't remember. And he was very apologetic and so on, and we had correspondence afterwards, but nothing ever came of it. And certainly no conservative government that I think will ever introduce any kind of payment system, uh, taxation, direct taxation for healthcare. Um, I, I think simple I think. things, I think, would go, small charges could go a long way to improving the efficiency of the delivery system. Yeah, I think we as a community work much harder to make the case, actually, and use the data. Uh, I mean, once you, what I discovered when I went and managed in the NHS is that it's just not an evidence-based, I mean, we talk about evidence-based medicine, but we don't have any evidence-based management. So it took me six months. Yeah. I mean, the King, Kings went to a deficit of 180 million pounds. That's when I was brought in. They fired the chairman, Kerslake, um, you know, there was blood all over the place. So it's part of your blame culture point as well. But it took a good six months to get to the bottom of what that <coughs> comprised. No, that is no way to run an operation. And this is taxpayers' money, you know. Yeah. So I think we need evidence-based management. We need to get the data. Uh, we need to present that in a, in a sober way and try to engage with the politicians because their job isn't easy. I mean, you know, they're waking up to headlines and, uh, and attack every day. Um, as our senior NHS manager, Simon Stevens, and so on. So I think we've got to help them, uh, you know, see the data, help them with a way forward to how we can position this, the narrative, and how we can bring about change on the ground that really improves outcomes. I think also the other point that you made about clinical managers, the clinicians need, there needs to be a, a process in place yeah, of training them in management skills so that they can participate in the management and the management decision making in the NHS going which some people would see as a retrograde step when actually the clinicians managed it totally but I think there's a need for a balance between the two for instance right now I mean the most common complaint I've heard from consultants they can never speak to a manager because they're always in meetings yeah, absolutely. They feel completely... So they can make no input into the process. It was a huge problem at King's. The, the clinicians felt they just had these decisions coming down from on top. Steve, do you want to comment on that as a yes, clinician? Yes, 20% of CEOs in the United States are medically qualified. It is a, it is a welcome recognition that the three of the big academic health science centres in London are now led by professors of medicine, incidentally. Uh, the fact that you don't have inverted commas management skills, which uh, some might say are generic, uh, that, that doesn't in any way discompensate you from actually having a very very detailed knowledge of how the medical system works I couldn't agree Absolutely. with you more uh, and, and basically in the Holland in Holland by the way every single one of the academic health science centers is run by a uh, professor of medicine um, it is something which we in Britain have struggled with I, I was very fortunate to be one of the first clinicians to go on to the NHS leadership program. Some might say I never didn't learn anything, but that's a slightly different uh, question. That, Some might say I didn't learn anything, but um, that's a different issue. We do definitely need to open up that. And it's because the insight you have from the medical perspective is almost by definition 
quicker and faster to get to the point. How you then do it is, of course, involves very, very complex work afterwards. I was going to finish by saying that Kings did start off with a surplus before Ian went, but that's just not true. Uh, it came in when it hit £180 million, pounds, just for the record. Okay, I, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Luke, Luke Jones, um, I think you had a related point. Um, I'm also conscious that some people will need to leave the call in a few minutes. So Luke, if you can make your point. Whilst Luke is talking, if anybody has a question that they've not put into the box, um, please put your hand up. I'm going to scan the screens to see if anybody's got their hand up. Luke, over to you. Yeah, hi. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm actually an NHS consultant in uh, central London. I'm an orthopaedic uh, surgeon and um, I've worked in the US as well. And I agree. I think we've got a lot to learn uh, from the US and the way they deliver healthcare and maybe the arrival of the Cleveland Clinic in London, which is a, a surgeon, a clinician owned and clinician delivered service might be a way that we can start to train some of our surgeons. But I think we'd all agree that there's no doubt we need to improve social care, the way that's integrated with, uh, with secondary care. We need to utilize the NHS. And I must say in the last five or six years that I've been interested in this, and indeed some of the work we've done with Rispublica, this, these conversations have been happening for all this time. One of the things that I find very frustrating as a, as, as a clinician is that everyone has their own private solution to the NHS problem. But what no one can tell me is how they're going to deliver that within the constraints of the current political system, which is that the politicians being elected on a five year basis and there's really no appetite to deliver proper reform in an aggressive fashion. And what, what, do, uh, what do the speakers think would be the way that these things can actually be delivered? So the question isn't what we should do, it's how we should do it in a real way that works in the real world. Otherwise, we're just talking to ourselves on, on Zoom calls on a, on a Monday afternoon. Well, I'd start out. I mean, as I said earlier, I think we need to take solutions to the politicians and recognise they've got a tough job and sort of shape, shape this so that they've got, I mean, I found working with politicians, give them a vision, give them something they can give a great speech about, they'll be happy. When you go to the civil servants, they'll want to know how does this work? Where's the PERT chart? You know, how does this? So you've, you've got to shape the message. But I think we've got to be more proactive about giving solutions uh, to, the, uh, to the politicians, because at the end of the day, you know, health outcomes in the UK are getting worse and worse. And that is going to be a political uh, millstone uh, eventually. You, you mentioned the Cleveland Clinic. The Cleveland Clinic was led for the last uh, 15 years by a chap called Toby Cosgrove. <clears throat> who was, before he became that, one of America's most famous heart surgeons, a truly extraordinary uh, individual. Uh, Cleveland Clinic comes top in most of the uh, United States best hospital uh, league table. So he, and, he is a demonstration. I think Ian's got it. Doctors have to step up to the plate and not be brushed aside at the wand of a hand, which has been the system in the past. I think that the uh, NHS management are just coming round to the fact of recognizing that your problem with the your issue with the politicians there isn't a politician in the world who's going to admit that the british healthcare system is not very good there are no votes in it and it'll be that they'll be out before they can do it so i agree it's a problem but i think it has to be a positive way forward by giving them solutions uh, which they can then support <clears throat> it is difficult luke you must know tim briggs um, <laughs> if you're an orthopod yeah. So getting people like Tim there, you know, I mean, he's, got his, he's got his rough edges, Tim, but, you know, I think he's fantastic. It's evidence-based, it's patient-driven, it's mobilizing clinicians. You know, that's the sort of program we need to, uh, to get moving. Great, thank you. And um, if I could go to Roger, because I think his point relates to this around public health. Um, and Stanley, I know you're waiting. We have your question there. Uh, so, Roger. You want to make your point? Yeah, just, I mean, I did PPE, so forgive a naive question. Um, if demand is always going to exceed supply, I've had years negotiating with the Treasury, and they, they, the response to any request for more resources, can't you just do it more efficiently? I want 3% savings. If that's the case, and digitalization and reorganization hasn't produced efficiencies, then the only alternative is to reduce demand. And there is an argument that you hear sometimes that demand for health services is high in the UK because of the way we live, because it's healthcare is free at the point of delivery. When I last went to A&E uh, in my West Kent hospital, it was full of drunk and disorderly and, and people just clogging up A&E. And, and, you know, a little bit of me was thinking, why the hell am I paying for this uh, and not my treatment? So what could we do to re restore PHE um, services? Put more emphasis on prevention and you know diabetes is the obvious one drug 
assistance, etc., is another. But you know, would that make a material difference? That's my question. Yeah, it would make a huge difference. And obesity is coming out with COVID-19 as another huge uh, risk factor. I mean, we do have, as I said in the paper, you know, some of the worst social outcomes, uh, high rates of, um, uh, um, uh, you know, of, of adolescent pregnancies. Uh, you know, we've got a, a huge bloody job to do. And it's got worse in the last 10 years. I mean, we have to own up to that. I think we've got to think about, um, you know, some... Um, some uh, radical solutions uh, you know i don't see why i mean many people will gasp no doubt why don't we charge people who turn up drunk and assault the staff um at uh, at a and e i said to my daughter a couple of years ago you know if you can spend 50 quid to get drunk you can spend 50 quid in fine she said dad you can get drunk for five pounds these days um but you know i think we've got to find ways of incentivizing people to uh, to treat it better missed appointments abuse to staff um, you know, this is this. We've got to find ways of incentivizing people to treat this scarce resource um, more um, uh, and more sanely. The, the only bit I'll add to that uh, is you need to get rid of the purchaser provider split. I'm not saying you have to have very strict controls over healthcare, but no orthopedic surgeon wishes to be doing an operation and find somebody's been smoking 40 fags a day before they come in and having to cancel the operation. Uh, nobody wishes to have people who are infected and go home and f beat, you know, f get into a fight and come back in next day and so on. Um, what there are no incentives at the moment for doing that. If you are able to create these social care, community care, mental health, and acute services, as we've developed over the last three to four weeks, and if you then give them a financial envelope in which each part of the system can do the bit that they are, in every case, professionally wanting to do, because that's what they've selected then you can move away from the false boundaries which are in place. You then will have to create a new financial mechanism for controlling costs and so on. I'm not that naive, but there are ways in which can, you can do that. And, and Roger, I think it must be re really awful for those of you who spent three years at university studying PPE, when people wonder why it takes three years to study about masks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm conscious it's now four o'clock. Um, I think Ian and Stephen, if you are you okay to stay on the line for a few more minutes? So can yeah, we have a couple, yeah. a couple of questions. Um, we've got two remaining questions in the chat. One from Stanley Burnton, uh, relating specifically to COVID, and a one from Simon, uh, relating to big data. So we'll go to both of those. While Stanley's speaking, if you've got any final questions you want to raise, please put them in the chat or please put your hand up, and I'll scan the screens again. Uh, on a totally, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a totally different uh, issue, it seems that the government is to outsource contact tracing. They're trying this app in the Isle of Wight, for some reason not going the, um, the um, Apple uh, Google route. But they're outsourcing rather than using local authority employees, staff. Do you have any views on that? Can I go first? But I also mentioned talking about um, affecting demand, and this also tells you something about uh, the politicians. Other countries have decriminalized drugs. Portugal is a very good example, uh, very successfully, and yet uh, no politician has ever raised the question here, as far as I know. Yeah, thank you for the question, on that, Stanley Burns and QC. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd just like to comment. Um, the government is, um, you know, arguably making yet another mistake. Uh, and I don't know if you heard uh, was it the Today programme this morning. We had the NHS now saying it's, it's, it's easily the best to be able to handle IT. Um, and, and Apple and Google know nothing about that. I mean, the breathtaking arrogance of a statement like that, which is run, actually, I have to say, from Oxford, um, but the idea that you can centralize that and that Apple and Google know nothing about it is palpably ludicrous. And, and it is compounded by the idea of using those outside agencies to handle something which is quintessentially done best by local authorities further uh, exemplifies the problem. So I will be astonished if the proposal which is being put forward uh, is, is effective. The, the normal concerns about safety and uh, data do not apply. Uh, and I think both of those decisions are breathtaking. Can I say, I, I was judge in charge of IT for a while in the um, oh, High Court Court of Appeal system. 
Right. And my gold, my golden rule was never ever try to develop your own software. <laughs> if there's something you can buy off the shelf that works, you buy it. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself spending an awful lot of money and achieving nothing. Yeah, exactly. and that was the experience. Companies were rather well known for this. To health. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've lost him. He's muted. You're muted, Gareth. Thank you, Stanley, for your question. Um, I will move on to Simon because I think this leads on to his question around big data. So, Simon uh, Dambe. Thank you. Um, I guess it also follows up a bit on what Luke was saying about uh, persuading politicians to invest in um, in the NHS. Um, so one aspect was this uh, uh, Google Health project where they're helping to digitize, uh, which follows on to some of the problems I think are mentioned in the paper about uh, lack of digitization of health records. And I'm curious as to why it's taking a US owned corporation to invest in this. Uh, it seems that that's the only way that this is able to get the funding it needs to happen. And on a related subject, um, I spoke to someone who was working in China with uh, Chinese biomedical companies and uh, connecting them up with UK companies. And they said that the in the past or the past 10 years, the UK had a leading position and that it risks losing that leading position the next 10 years as there was just so much investment in China. And I'm just interested in those points, I guess maybe from a more financial perspective, if anything can be done to make the case that there is this return on investment for investing in medicine. Stephen, do you want to go first? Uh, no, probably you in first, I would have thought. I mean, the, the tech game has been has been lost, unfortunately. I mean, something like 80% of all tech activity is China and America. I think of the top 50 tech companies in the world, only one is European, SAP. So, you know, there's a lot we can do. And I think the UK is, uh, you know, is ahead of the game in in many areas, although the Scandinavians are good as well in, uh, in healthcare uh, technology. So I think we've got to be careful as a country to choose where we're going to invest. Um, but you know, we, we're going to have to partner with the Googles and the Apples. You know, probably most people on this call <laughs> find them a very disturbing bunch of, uh, of folks. Um, but we're going to have to you know, be sensible and smart about how we deal with them and stern. Um, but um, you know, I think the tech game is, has largely been lost. And just to comment on China, having set up companies in China, you have to recall that um, the minute you do any collaboration with China, you lose the IT because they steal it. We could do another one on my Ministry of Defence, not exactly be an interesting one, Gareth. Yes. I think you wanted to ask something. Who was that, Ian? Sorry, who are you directing that to? It was Eng, I think. He was waving. Anyway, I'll leave it to you too. Uh, I can't see them. Can you wave again? Oh, if you're he's waving. Ah, okay, Lawrence. Go ahead, Lawrence. Hey guys, you seem to have missed my question. Which is the question on the taxation. Please take us back to that. Is the British public accustomed as it now is to a low tax environment? Really prepared to pay a hypothecated tax? Well, it's going to be better than uh, general taxation. I mean, as somebody once said, I've no, I didn't say this, you know, we, in the UK, we expect Swedish style public services and American style tax rates. And it's just not going to, you know, the, 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 it just doesn't work. So we're either going to have to uh, have lower outcomes or, or we're going to have to tax more. And hypothecated tax at least ring fence Bring fences it and makes it easier to raise taxes for something that people do seem to care for about but it is a very difficult problem yeah. but the Lib Dems made that promise at the last election look what happened to them yeah but that wasn't the only well, reason they and did. another reason why <laughs> disappeared from the sea thanks Lawrence and we have uh, one final question I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not sure I'm not sure we'll be able to answer this question but um from R.D. Ma, I'm afraid I don't know your name, R.D. Ma, but you, I have unmuted you, so please go ahead. 
I can read the question. So uh, society, yeah, no, well, I think it is a it is a big. I think that's part of the devolution agenda. Frankly, I think we we have got by by every measure the most centralized state in Europe. So we have sucked a lot of the energy, not Wales and Scotland, obviously, but the rest of England, you know, we've sucked a hell of a lot of the energy out of those um, regions uh, and created this, you know, huge boom in uh, London and the, and the Southeast. I think many of the, and maybe that was reflected in the Brexit vote. So I think this is a long-term strategy where we need to rebuild the resilience and self-respect uh, of regions. I think there are some places where you can do that, Manchester, and um, Leeds, uh, but places like uh, Birkenhead, where I'm from, or Workington, you know, it's very, very difficult to see how we can, and I think they're going to have to become part of the penumbra of, uh, uh, you know, of investment in our cities and the, and the core parts of our, to recreate society. I think it is a very big problem. And we go back to Thatcher's famous quote back in whenever it was, you know, there is no such thing as society. And I think that's, uh, that's damaged us over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Great, thank you. Um, well, I think that's all of the questions done. Uh, I'll qu quickly scan the screens. If anybody is waving madly, I'll go to them, but it looks like um, we've reached a natural conclusion.